welcome to today's episode of Building with Open Talk series. My name is Monik and I'm your host. And today we'll be doing a webinar on network performance and testing. So we'll talk about uh, you know, how network affects WebRTC and how, what you need to have, what your requirements are. And we'll also go and do a building and module so you can test out before you join a call, the conditions that your users are in. Um, I'm here with Nexmo's team actually in Denver today. So we're at the 360 iDev conference. It's been a great week. So if you have any questions about iOS, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and just to tell you a little bit more about Nexmo, um, TalkBox got acquired August 1st by Vonage, uh, which is the parent com company of Nexmo. And so now we're actually serving over 600,000 developers. So great news all along. Nexmo has a great APIs on SMS, Verify, so two-factor authentication, number lookups, and voice as well. So definitely give them a look, and we'll see you soon on that one. Um, so next, I'd like to give a little shout out to Crowdcast for hosting all our webinars here. Um, and also, if you have have you had the chance to you know look at the past webinars, you can see them all at crowdcast.io/talkbox, where you'll see you know the archiving recording webinars we did, Swift and iOS. So these are live coding webinars that we've done before, React Native, Electron, and Embeds. But then there's other topics that we've covered, like GDPR, which is really important as well. So those are all available, and you can check them out. And if you have any questions, you can definitely reach out to me directly, or you can check out the blog or reach out support. So today's agenda, we'll be talking about the OpenTalk basics um, and understanding real-time networking, essentially, and then going over the JavaScript network test module we do have an iOS one as well. We won't be covering that today, but we will do like a quick summary on what, what that is. And then we'll also be going over the inspector tool that allows you to do um, a post-session diagnostics as well. So a little bit about the basics. Um, TalkBox key concepts are around sessions, tokens, and publishing and subscribing. These concepts are all across the iOS, Android, web, and you know Windows SDK, so they don't change essentially. Um, and sessions are a chat room, so just like we're all in a chat room right now, um, it has a unique session ID tied to it, and you can generate this on your you know your app server, which is what you would do in production, or for the sake of testing, you could do it um, through an account dashboard. And we'll go over that on how to do that today. Um, you can also you know this is where users are publishing, as I am publishing, and you folks are subscribing to me. Uh, this is all happening within a session, and. We all have tokens. So in order to connect to a session, each individual must have a token, and this is used to authenticate. So it's actually like a key card when you go into a hotel room or when you're you know, accessing a building. Same way it works like that. Um, it expires after a certain time, so you kind of need a renewal process or generate a new token after that. And it can have metadata that you can use to describe information about that client. Um, we don't recommend you having personally identifiable information within token, inf within token data, excuse me. And lastly, uh, publishing and subscribing. So uh, publishing and subscribing, I mentioned it just a little earlier. So I'm publishing, you folks are subscribing to me, but if everybody was publishing, I would be subscribing to the other streams as well. It's like sending a stream and receiving a stream. It's as simple as that. Um, and it's talking about you know audio and video. Um, and so this is the API model that we have. If you can see my screen well, um, you can see there's this OpenTalk cloud. Um, this is involved when you wanna send media through Open talk, um, and Lawrence, our guest today, will be mentioning a little bit more about that. Um, and here, you know, you can see if you want to have a peer-to-peer -peer connection versus a uh, session that's going routed through the Open Talk cloud, and you can see session IDs are generated on the app server, and you can render them on a client where the client can go ahead and publish and subscribe. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lawrence Bird today, who's going to give a talk on the networks um, and the real-time involved in WebRTC. Thank you very much, Manik, and thank you for inviting me into the Building with OpenTalk series. I'm going to provide an overview for what are the network considerations uh, when using OpenTalk and WebRTC. Many of you are out there are experts at this, are well familiar with this, uh, and uh, so this is an overview, uh, hopefully useful for people who are sort of coming up to speed on this. So next slide, please. So. The key thing about uh, using APIs that are do with communications is the concept of separation of control and media. Uh, the APIs that are asking for things to happen are traveling over completely different paths, potentially, than the media. And we see this in the simplest peer-to-peer, -peer, what we call relayed mode, where you may be talking to a cloud application, but the media is moving in some completely different path. So all of you who've been doing communications APIs are familiar with this, uh, but this is often new to those who come from the web uh, app world where talking to a server and getting a result back 
uh, doesn't involve this separation of media. So we have to understand where is all this media going? And in order to get the media to flow, there are various things that are happening for you completely automatically within the OpenTalk API. So things like the negotiation of how do I talk to you? A protocol called ICE might use something that you see called STUN. You really don't have to worry about that at all. The thing that you have to know is that there may possibly be some turn servers. A turn server is an intermediate server that's used to relay the media when you bump into firewall problems that just don't let you get in and out of the firewall. So if you're on a mobile phone, if you're on the general internet, uh, that's not an issue. But if you're in a corporate environment with a heavy firewall, then it's quite likely that you can't get a media stream in or out, in which case it will then be relayed. In the ideal world, your firewall will allow what's called UDP traffic to flow, which is traffic that's not controlled, can get lost, and that's all OK because this is real time. If packets get lost, you really, after a while, don't want them anymore. But sometimes it has to be TCP that guarantees packet delivery and is therefore less effective for real time. So you have to have some understanding that this may be going on and that firewalls may be affecting your network performance. Next slide. The more common case is where we're using access through servers. So we call that the routed model within OpenTalk. And your streams are going up and down uh, to servers. And in the cloud, in the top box cloud, there is a store and forward unit, uh, which is a you know, horrible name, one of these techie names like cell phone instead of handy or mobile as it is in other parts of the world, uh, the SFU, which is going to route these streams. And so WebRTC and the OpenTalk platform is based on the idea of getting the right streams to the right place without trying to transcode them or mix them or do expensive things to them in the middle, which means if I have a four-way conference like you see here, then there's Potentially, each client is sending a stream and receiving the other three streams from various places. There's a notion of simulcast where I might be sending multiple resolutions, and I'm going to come on and talk about that. And even in this case where we're talking to the server, I may still have challenges getting through a firewall, and it's possible that OpenTalk will introduce a turn server that will introduce you know, another sort of relay point that has to be gotten through. If you're an enterprise customer of OpenTalk, then there's a range of additional capabilities that you can get into. So the concept of regional media zones. The idea here is that you tell us, I do not want my media leaving the US. I do not want my leave media leaving the EU. I do not want my media leaving Germany. Uh, Germany has some very strict rules for certain class of application. And therefore, these are the three media zones that we have and at an enterprise level, you can uh, specify where you want the media to stay. So banking, insurance, medical, uh, those kind of applications, this can be a capability. We also have a lot of customers who have end clients in China, particularly see this in the educational sector uh, and uh, entertainment areas and other areas. Uh, we have a capability called China Relay, which essentially puts intermediate servers directly into China to make sure that we can reliably uh, get through the, the big firewall, the big China firewall, um, in, in a reliable way. We're not just leaving it up to chance. So in addition, uh, there are some applications, and we see this in highly regulated industries, where you want to control where the turn traffic goes if turn is required to get out of your firewall. And we have another capability called configurable turn. The other benefit of going through the server in addition to all this media routing that's getting the right media to the right people, is, of course, that we're able to do recording. This session is being recorded. If you wait until the end, the recording will pop up on the screen here. Uh, and that is using our recording archiving capability that Manic talked about last time in the webinar. We also have broadcast APIs that are allowing RTMP streams and HLS streams, and, in fact, Crowdcast, uh, the application here that's built on Topbox um, has an HLS stream. So if you're watching this from Safari, uh, then it will have flipped it into an HLS stream that will be slightly delayed uh, from the real-time stream that the rest of you would be seeing. And then 
as all this data flows in and out of the server, then we get tools like Inspector that Manic will talk about, the analytics tools, all sorts of capabilities on the server. So this is all the value add of the Topbox uh, cloud. Now, even though we see the cloud as one big thing, it's still the case that the API calls are going to API servers, and the media may be going somewhere else. It's going to media servers. It's being controlled with respect to regional zones. So the separation of control and media continues, even though we see this as a sort of single amorphous cloud. So these are clearly all principles that we think about when we think about performance. We want to count the number of streams that are coming in and out of our clients and make sure that we understand why we're using all those streams. Is this how we want to design our application? So next slide, now. So key quality for video is driven by the resolution and the frame rate, which drives bandwidth. And we have recommendations. There's an excellent little article from uh, Taha on our support site, what is the minimum bandwidth requirement to use OpenTalk, that looks at different video resolutions and different frame rates. And typically, you're using everything up to 720p. You're probably seeing this in 720p, uh, and resolutions up to 30 frames a second. And as these go up, the bandwidth goes up, right? The reason that things like 4K video are less relevant for these kind of interactive live video sessions is that they use absolutely colossal amounts of bandwidth that your clients are unlikely to have. So as you design applications, you need to be thinking about, and I'm sure you do, you know, who needs to see who and at what resolution. Uh, right now you're seeing Manic and me in little teeny windows, um, but you're seeing the screen share in a big window. But the screen share, using OpenTalk screen share, doesn't need to have the same frame rate. So it has a much lower frame rate, which you'll notice if you try and run videos through screen share is that they don't look good because it's deliberately designed for sharing screens that simply don't move as fast uh, as Manic and myself. And then into this is this concept of simulcast. So OpenTalk builds simulcast in automatically. When you get three or more publishers, uh, subscribers, sorry, then if you're on the right platform, it will start publishing multiple resolutions so that you can have a little resolution that is what you're probably seeing in the upper left-hand corner, and you can have larger resolutions for the people who are in focus. And we provide that uh, when using the VP8 codec on our native SDKs now, uh, recently since 2.14, and on Chrome. We are still waiting for other browsers. Other browsers are starting to offer support. And um, we're still waiting for this to be available for H.264, uh, which is being worked on, but isn't in a, in a good state. If you want to know more about Simulcast, then there's a good article on uh, WebRTC hacks. And there's another article in our support uh, documentation uh, that you can go look at. And as I say, once again, this is, this is happening automatically. But it's the reason, and you can see on Manic's screen here, that we're running this all from Chrome, because we want to make sure that for this kind of broadcast use, where you have a small number of publishers, there's three streams being published right now, me, Manic, and the screen share at a lower frame rate, we want to make sure that those are available to you, even if you're on a, a poor network environment, they will, you will be delivered the lower resolution screen. So all of that is being managed by the SFU, in order to take account of uh, network bandwidth properties. Next slide, now. So the key things to look at are clearly the kind of network you're on. And for most applications, you don't have a lot of control of that. Um, I'm sitting here, and also Manic, we happen to have wired Ethernet connections because we're paranoid. Um, most of the time you're using Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi is an environment that can easily get congested. You may have very high bandwidth out to the internet, but everybody in the office is busy, you know, wasting the bandwidth. It may not be configured very well in various settings, um, and therefore it's congested at the point uh, where you're trying to access it. Similarly, uh, for mobile devices, you're typically often using 4G LTE. But as you know from your experience, you know, Wi-Fi, 4G LTE, all work pretty well with OpenTalk applications, except in the worst case where the pipe gets narrow now. 
And then, of course, there's a fourth kind of network that uh, does not obey the uh, principles of physics called hotel networks, and that's what Manic is on right now. Uh, and who knows how they work, but they're typically awful. The drivers of video quality, therefore, are going to be the bandwidth that you have and things that are happening to your packets as they go up and down the pipe. Remembering that you may have multiple streams, you're probably publishing a stream, or you may be, in fact, publishing more than one stream, and you're probably receiving multiple streams, as you are here. The SFU is trying to take care of that and make sure that you're getting streams that uh, make sense if there's simulcast going on. But the pipe itself may be introducing packet loss. There may be delay going on. And then there's this thing called jitter, which is essentially variability and delay. You get a whole bunch of stuff, and then there's a gap, and then you get a whole bunch of stuff, which makes it very hard to make deliver a streaming uh, video environment. The OpenTalk SDKs are constantly and frantically trying to deal with these issues, and therefore that's why you sometimes see uh, the quality of the picture sort of change as the bit rate is varied, which then varies the amount of information that will be sent from a publisher. One of the key benefits of the simulcast environment that we're in here is that the publisher is not being told, oh, there's this awful device over there, slow down, because the SFU is doing the work. I'm sending multiple streams, and if you have a horrible device connection, then uh, I'm going to send you uh, Lawrence's lowest quality stream, uh, but I'm not going to do that for everybody else. So that's one of the key benefits of simulcast in an open talk SFU environment. So measuring all of these things then becomes important. Uh, next slide. And a tool that I'm sure many of you use is you fire up speed test. So this is my home network where I have colossal amounts of download speed. I don't have very good upload speed, though. But then when I run um, OpenTalk Demo, which is a demo application, which has built into it the kind of code that Nan is going to show you next, it shows a different number, so why is that? Well, speed test is trying to test for how much stuff can I possibly jam into the pipe that I have in front of me. Whereas that's not interesting if what I'm really trying to do is to get a single connection from this app, this piece of JS code running in uh, Chrome, to the servers, and I want to see exactly what is happening all the way between those points. I don't care if I could simultaneously be downloading uh, a dozen web pages, that doesn't help me for the video. So while speed test is kind of useful, it's kind of a rule of thumb, it always gives you great numbers, and then, while well, something else is happening. Well, it's not showing you packet loss, it's not showing you delay, and it's not showing you what the real connectivity is uh, to the servers, uh, to the OpenTalk servers. So therefore, building in testing into your applications becomes key. And what you see here is that when I was uh, taking the screenshot last night, um, I have excellent connectivity, um, but a completely different number from what speed test is showing. But it's because I have a good speed test network uh, that I get these numbers. And what's important is the video performance I'm getting, and then separately from that, audio. Because as you know, if the video starts to look bad, we want to maintain the audio for as long as possible, ultimately turning off the video uh, in, in really bad environments uh, so that we can hear each other uh, even if seeing each other uh, is temporarily difficult. So, I'm going to go on to the next slide, and I believe yep. we'll bring the, the live coding on here. So essentially, um, you know, Lawrence gave a very great overview on how it works under the hood, and we kind of want to use all that information that Lawrence mentioned to build on top of it. So the screenshot that you see that Lawrence took uh, yesterday um, we're going to build something similar, but we'll we'll do it for the numbers, not necessarily UI. And then we'll go ahead and build a sample application to show you what you can actually build with all these da all this data that you get from it. So I'm actually going to go ahead and go to my terminal. So um, just Lawrence, if you could do me a favor, give me a you know thumbs up if the screen looks big enough, and if it doesn't, feel free to stop me at any time. So I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to create a new project and we're going to call it Network. Let's just call it Net Test. So I'm going to change my directory into this net test. Then I'm going to initialize an NPM project very quickly. Just press some enter all the way down. And then now I'm going to install the OpenTalk JS SDK. 
And this is required, obviously, to be able to, you know, have all this publishing, subscribing, the whole OpenTalk SDK takes care of that. We also want to install this uh, OpenTalk network test AS. And this essentially allows us to, you know, do all this testing and get us. So this is an API built on top of TalkBox's JS SDK. So to get this started, I know I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up my code editor and I'm going to zoom in so everybody can see. But before that, I'm just going to go ahead and create this file called index.js. But hopefully this is zoomed in for everybody so they can get a good idea of what I'm typing here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, import the network test. And I'm going to do the required method. We'll be using Browserify for this. But um, you know you can definitely use the the build um, to uh, you know also <clears throat> you can also get the build and use it regularly as you would. So here I'm gonna do the network test and I want to also get the OpenTalk SDK here because that's a requirement. So I'm gonna just get the OpenTalk client and I'm gonna go ahead and initialize this using the network test constructor. So I got new and then the network test constructor and this takes in the OpenTalk object and a few credentials. So this is the API key. We have a session ID that's required. And I'm leaving these blanks because I have to actually get this. I'm not going to generate it from a server, but instead I'll do the OpenTalk dashboard, account dashboard, and get it from there. So as you can see, I've done this. But now let's go ahead and go to our OpenTalk dashboard to get this, these credentials. So I'm going to go back to Chrome, go to my account. And then here I'm going to create a project. So you can essentially go projects create new project, and you can either choose the video chat embeds or the OpenTalk API. But for this specific case where we're using the API, we must use the OpenTalk API. Uh, the video chat embeds are built on top of the API, but it's essentially an iframe tag that you can drop on your website uh, to get started. If that's, and if you have any questions about that, please check out our, our first webinar that we did uh, on the Building with OpenTalk series, and you'll see how we can walk through. But for majority of the reasons that you know, Lawrence is mentioning recording and archiving and these features, these must use the OpenTalk API. So I'm going to go ahead and create a custom project. And I'm going to call this network test webinar. You can call it whatever you'd like. You can choose your codec. Since we'll be using Chrome for this, we're just going to go ahead and uh, use VP8. If you wanted to use Safari, we'd have to set the setting to H.264. I'm going to go ahead and click on this create button. And this should be able to create a project for me. Um, not sure what happened there, so I'm going to reload my page. And I believe the project should have been created, but we can verify that by going down our list. It looks like there was an issue. And I'm going to go ahead and try to do the exact same thing again. Network test webinar, creating a project. And perfect. So I have this project here. Uh, the API key is what we need on the uh, client side, the project secret. This is what we need on the server side to be able to generate this. Um, I'm sharing this in my webinar, but I'm going to delete this as soon as this is over because you know the project secret is something that shouldn't be shared across anywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and actually copy this here. And I'm going to go ahead back to my code editor and paste my API key. And then I'm going to move down. And before I get you know, deeper, I just want to show a little quick info on the dashboard. Here, essentially, you can have insights so you can see you know, what your errors you're getting, the quality, the date range, the usage, all the endpoints that you have, so iOS, Android, Windows, and JavaScript. And so this is an inside dashboard, essentially, that you can use to see the consumption and all that information. This is really great. Um, and we are working on an API very similar to this. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out on that. Um, and we also have you know, the settings, uh, session monitoring and SIP call monitoring. Session monitoring, essentially, you can receive events on the server side, like connection created, connection destroyed, and stream created and stream destroyed. So these are events that are available. You can just configure a callback here, a webhook, and get that going. Similarly, SIP call monitoring, you can do that. This is in beta right now. So if you do want to check that out, feel free to do so. And there's other information about archiving and callbacks and the session inspector tool, which we'll be visiting a little shortly after. So I'm concerned about creating a session. I'm going to go ahead and create the session. I'm going to go ahead and copy this session ID. And we'll do, go here. And then let's go back to Chrome and gen, use the same session ID to generate a token. I'm going to set this to publisher. And I'm going to make it expire just a little later, just because um, you know we don't want it to expire while we're doing this. So that should be good right there. And we can go ahead and add our token here. So now that we've instantiated our network test object, you know, uh, we can go ahead and start testing. So here we can just essentially do test connectivity. That's the first method we want to do. And then this actually returns a promise. So we're going to get a, let's call it connectivity re result. 
and this here. And obviously we want to be able to catch this, but we'll get into that a little later. And we want to also, in this, we want to also do the network test for testing the quality. So this is important when we want to get all the information on the packet loss and stuff. So the first method here is testing your connection. Are you able to make a connection? That's the first thing. And then when you do that, let's go ahead and start testing this quality. And now I can actually add a callback here. We call it the update callback. And you can essentially get this to get information on them. So let's just say quality callback. And I'm going to simply just console log all this information for the sake of showing you what the data looks like. And after that, we can actually just return the promise as well. And in this promise, we can save the results. This is the result that we'll get after the 30 seconds that it takes to get this test. So let's go ahead and result. And in this result, it'll tell us that we should be going in with video or we should be uh, only going in audio. And with frame rate, we should be setting our properties. So the reason that this is great is because if you do this before you actually start a conversation or a video call, you can set your publisher properties to, you know, based on this result, so that you can have the most optimal experience when you're doing this web, uh, when you're doing this, you know, call or webinar. Um, I also want to catch an error. So in case there's an error, let's go ahead and catch that, and we'll just say console.log. Oops. And we'll just say test quality error. Oops. Excuse my spelling. And then. Lastly, I want to also catch this, the main one when we have an error with our connectivity. We can just say console log connectivity error. And I'm just going to print out the error that I get. Obviously, you can, you know, we have enumerations of, you know, you can get these error codes that we give out. So you can definitely, you know, put this in a try catch statement and, you know, switch, switch off of the error codes that you receive. But for the sake of this, you know, we're just going to go ahead and do this. So before I go any further, I want to actually go ahead and create an HTML page. So just because it'll be easier there to run a script tag. Oops. So I go ahead and created this. I'm going to HTML tag. I had tag where I can place a script. And I'm actually going to use Browserify, as I mentioned, because I'm using the require method to common JS essentially on the client side. So I'm going to call my file that I'm going to, that Browserify is going to get for me app.js, right? So we're going to go ahead and switch to our terminal. And let's use Browserify, and the file that we have is index.js, but we want to output into app.js. So we can use this command that Browserify allows you to, and you'll be able to essentially see all that. So just to verify that it all worked, you can see app.js, and we can see all this that's done, and that's um, Browserify doing this for us. So now, if we want to actually check how this looks, I'm going to open up the folder and just click on the index.html, and this should open in the browser. And I'm also going to show you my console. So give it a second while this goes. And we should be able to get this running. Interesting. Not seeing anything there or any errors. So not sure what's happening there. But if you just give me a second, we should be able to get this going. Huh. I'm going to go look at the code just to verify because it's very simple to make it. You know, mistakes out here. Oh, there it is. Happened to the source. So I wonder I was getting an error. And perfect. This requires an API key. So we know we're getting an error here. We're going to go back here and go to our index.js and see, ah, this is a session ID. So it's great to debug. This is what's really best about this. You can actually see what's going on. And now since we made a change to our actual index.js file, we actually have to use Browserify again so we can bundle this all up again. So after bundling it up, we're going to go back to our Chrome browser. I'm going to go ahead and reload. And now this is good. So this, the SDK is asking me, the module is asking me to camera permissions, and you can do all this. So now we should be start receiving our callback, and this is a callback that we set into. I know it's hard to see, so I'm going to zoom in as much as possible. But essentially, this callback is telling us some information. So if I look into this, it'll say, okay, how much packet loss am I getting for audio and video and the bytes I'm sending? And this is information. So this is the callback that we're, you know, essentially it's happening while the test is being completed. As you can see, there's 24, 23, 25 messages. Um, the callback, I mean, this test automatically goes for 30 seconds. So after 30 seconds, you know, it'll give you a result, and we'll go scroll down right now. Um, you see 35 messages because of the messages out here. So I'm going to go all the way down, and you can see I have results. Uh, you can actually use the options parameter in the constructor to set this from anywhere from 5 to 30 seconds. 5 is minimum for us to be able to get some great results, and 30 is the maximum we'll run this, which is also the default value. 
You can also choose audio only option to run the test. So if you don't want to do any video stuff, you can just do it audio. So based on this, let's check out the results. So we're saying, okay, we got zero packet loss ratio. Uh, the MOS score is 4.42, which is considered excellent in this case. Uh, MOS scores usually range from one to five, which are based on a subjective test. But for this case, we're actually using ours from one to 4.5 doing an objective test. And if you want to learn more about well, how MOS scores work in connectivity, uh, the repo that I'm going to share in the, excuse me, in the chat box is where you can learn all about how, why we're using it for one to 4.5 and what we consider excellent versus poor quality. So this is audio and I'm going to go ahead and click on the video tab and it'll tell me, okay, this is a bit rate. This is what it's telling us to use. So based on my network condition, even though I'm at a hotel and I have an ethernet cable, it's suggesting that I go with 30 frame rates. And that's because the peer connection that we had and it, the, the information that we got from this network, this module is suggesting that we can actually go into high definition with recommended frame rate. And this is the MOS course, which is also considered excellent um, by this. So this is all great to see numbers, right? But we want to be able to see what we call a visualization of this. So to show you a visualization, I'm actually going to show you our pre-call test, which pre-call test uses this network module to, to show you a visualization. So I'm going to show this. This is a tool. And this pre-call tool, I can press audio only, just what I said. And this programmatically changes it to with their different conditions. Or I can just press run test. And this is running a test. As you can see, I didn't have to give it an API key, excuse me, or a secret, excuse me, sorry about that, or session ID or token because it's already, you know, on talkbox.com, it has that information for me already available, and it's using that uh, session ID and token to get this. So you can see this chart, uh, you can see the video bit rate stability and audio bit rate, and I'll do it for, I think, about 20 to 30 seconds, depending on what it's set to. As I mentioned, you can do that, um, and you can cancel the test anytime if you want, and on this chart, you can see all this information. So the camera is going to actually, this is the different fake camera I'm using, and that's a different one. Uh, but you're essentially saying, okay, this looks great. We were able to connect to the API server. The messaging was working, which is different than the media, which is also working, the logging server. And we have a pretty great, excellent um, quality. And this is something that you can actually build with the information that's given to you there. So I'm going to go ahead and click back on this. And I'm actually going to use the sample application that comes with the OpenTalk Network JS module to build out something very much stripped down, but to give you a perspective on how that could work. So go back to our terminal again, actually. And in our terminal, what we can do is, uh, I'm going to just go into the node, uh, the modules. So the module, and this is called the OpenTalk Network Test.js. And this has a samples folder. And in here, we can just do it install. So we want to be able to install there, because the sample doesn't get installed when you install the package just because that's not needed. It's there as a part of a package if you're actually building or contributing to it. And the best part about this network test is that it's open source. So you can contribute to it anytime you want. You can file issues. You can go on the repo directly to you know, interact with the engineers who've been building this product. Um, so now we've done that. And I'm actually just going to go ahead and open this. And just to make it look a little cleaner on here, I'm just going to make it a little look, better, look a little better. So this is what I just opened. And it's super zoomed in, so hopefully everybody can see. Uh, but I have this source, and in this source, I have this config. And this is what I need to change again. I'm actually, the application requires it to be called config.js, but get ignored, so we don't have any issues for that. And we simply just need to copy our station ID and token that we added here. So we can use the same information here. And I'm going to go ahead and grab that information here as well. And then lastly, I'm going to simply get the token that we need for our authentication. And as you can see, we have an H.264 config here as well. So this is if you're using the Safari. Safari requires H.264 codecs. So we don't, we're not going to go over that today, but that's available for simply just making those changes. So I'm going to go back in here, and I'm going to say, OK, npm run build, because I need to build this. And after it's going to build, we can actually run. So now that we've built this sample application, we can just say npm start, which is, oh, apologies for that. Let's go ahead and look into this start script. Looks like we don't have a start script. So I think the build and, oh, the build is actually done. So I apologize for that. We are not running a server here. The build actually takes care of the file. And since it's client side only, we're simply going to open this in Chrome. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this clear app, open. And this is going to open up the directory. Click on this index.html. And this should open up 
a very stripped down version of the pre-call test that you saw. So I can go ahead and click start test. And this is the first method that we saw testing connectivity. So we need that initially before we even go to the quality because if we can't make a connection with the open talk servers, then we can't go and proceed further. So this is what we're doing. And essentially, this is also gonna tell us information about our connection. I know I'm getting a little quick, a little fast there, but if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the, the chat. And also there is a poll that's going on. So please tell us if you're, you know, how you're using TalkBox, if you're using the inspector tool, or if you have a, a similar network test module that you've set up um, that you use. So once again, we're getting pretty excellent quality on audio and video, the bit rate. We recommend about, you know, obviously 40 uh, kbps for audio and at least 250 for video, just so we can get it, you know, at least a decent call going so the good interactions. Uh, but as you can see, we use the code that's in the sample uh, to be able to build this module. Super easy to do. And if you want to look at it for reference, because I mentioned it's all open source, you can go to this link and we'll share this link in the chat. And this will say, okay, open talk network test JS. So now, if you're a mobile user, how do you make this happen for your mobile application? So we do have a sample called OpenTalk Network Test. This is also an open source application. Uh, but the dif difference between this mainly is the JavaScript comes as a module that you can add into your application as like a dependency, whereas this is just a sample application on how you can build some sort of app within the application. So this is code samples versus the other one as a module with an API. Um, we are hopefully going to get to the making the API to the network test for iOS and Android as well, because we just think it's it's better for the customer, it's better for the endpoint, and it's better for the developer, um, because this definitely lets you minimize your error rates that you get, because that before you go into a call, you already know what conditions you're actually going to be going into. Um, so that's that there. If you have any questions on like how the SDK works, please check out our developer center, and this developer center has access to the basics, the SDKs, uh, the developer tools and the beta programs. So since we're talking about developer tools here, we mentioned that we have pre-call. Uh, we also have a playground tool, which is used when you're building an application and you want like another endpoint connecting into the same session. You can do that to the playground. Archive, so we mentioned this archive inspector in the past webinar where we talked about recording and you wanted to see, you know, with an archive ID, if the recording is ready or how long it is, it's just information about that. And then inspector. So inspector is this really great post diagnostic tool um, it tells you summary about the and statistics, the user data, the errors that your users had in this, the different quality metrics, so the bit rate, the you know uh, the packet loss, and et cetera that we saw, and you know pre-call, but we'll do this. Well, what actually happened in the session? And without further ado, I'm going to pull up this session. So I have this session essentially uh, with a call that I had with one of my coworkers, actually Lawrence, and uh, we. We're essentially, you know, doing a meeting. So the statistic were we had three users. We had, you know, this was happening over multiple times. This was two meetings, so the same session ID, but we did it on two separate occasions. So it was two meetings that we had, um, the start time, the duration of this total. Um, and you can see that you have total stream minutes, how many issues we encountered, the different types of SDKs we used. So we essentially are using one, we use the JavaScript SDK. Um, and you can identify the different users here that were involved in this. And also you can see the user data. So if I wanted to minimize this, go to the user data, you can see the location and the SDK they use and the errors they receive and the GUIDs, which is like tied to a user. But then you also have something called a connection, uh, which is, you know, one GUID could have multiple connections and one connection could have multiple streams. So that's all available for you to check out here. And error logs, this is really important. As you saw, there were no errors in the meeting that we had on these meetings, which is great because that means that none of us really had an issue connecting and communicating over this application. And lastly, you know, going back to the, the quality metrics, we can see the bit rate in those calls. So you can see that user one, um, it's difficult to see here. So I'm gonna zoom in super, super duper zoom in. And you can see that the video bit rate, the codec that we're using, the specific stream ID, and then you can also check out you know, different users. And if I really wanted to, I'm gonna check out the packet loss. So how much packet loss did I, did I get as a person? So you saw 0.06% on audio. It's just not that much at all. You can see some packet loss here as well. And then you can see latency. So 300 milliseconds is like the ideal way to go. Less than that is great to be really, it's a threshold essentially. And you can see for the majority of the session, and considering I've been on hotel Wi-Fi, I'm very surprised that it was actually for the majority of the session being able to 
be way under this threshold. And you can see this spikes up a little bit, but it goes down and normalizes. So uh, that's all available for you to look at after your session is over. Um, and lastly, what you can check is the event log. So this is really great. So if I wanted to see, so everything that happens is happens as an event, right? So somebody connects, somebody starts publishing, somebody disconnects, somebody starts, uh, or somebody doesn't disconnect, but they just stop publishing their video. All these are considered client events, and we have some server events that are also available. And you can use these events to kind of figure out what could have gone wrong and how the sequence worked. And you can actually filter it by different users. So if I only wanted to look at the user one events, I can do that, or the user three, and the different type of filtrations I want to add. If I only wanted to look at server events or client events, um, I can do all that. Um, and you can actually export this data. So I can actually download all these events that I really wanted to. So this is actually a fantastic tool uh, for you to be able to you know, look at it. This is not real time, but it's pretty close. It's pretty darn close. You can you know, look at stuff um, you know, as the session is progressing, but, you know, so, but it's really meant for post-diagnostic. Uh, and this is all I have for in terms of showing for inspector. Uh, I do want to go back and take the time to take some questions and field some answers like there. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go ahead and move over and see what the questions are. So we have a lot of questions, Manic. Um, we're going to try a technique here uh, where I'll read them while you look at them uh, so that we know, know the questions. Uh, first, let's take a quick look at the polls. Um, and we don't control this. You just have to go click polls on the bottom left. And uh, what you'll see is the first question was, in your apps, do you use the network test code? And um, a few, some people, yes, already using it. A bunch of people, no, but uh, tending towards interested or actively planning. So that's great. And uh, on the inspector tool, uh, again, a balance of yeses and nos. Uh, but people interested in planning to, and you know you can do that with any session, and it's certainly worth getting good at being uh, dexterous with Inspector. Now we ask you to go click on Ask a Question, and uh, you can bring that up full screen if you want, make us small, or you can just look at the pop-up. There's a little full screen button, um, and uh, I'm going to read some of these and manic uh, look for your answers. So. Uh, Vignesh has already provided an answer to what happens if a publisher loses his connection, how can I know the other side? How do I display a message? What am I going to do on the subscriber end? Um, but it says just to add on. messages for publishers subscribing but wants to show the messages on the other end. Right. So just to answer the first question, uh, thank you, Vignesh, for helping and jumping in on this one. But when it, by connection, if you mean a person gets completely disconnected they're, and they're publishing, a couple of events will fire. Something called stream destroyed. So a stream was destroyed, and then a connection got destroyed. So can, those are the events that you should be looking for. And then do, you can use those to display messages that you'd like. Um, you can also use things like, you know, if if on your end your session did, you know, you disconnect, you can begin reconnecting. So the SDKs have a built-in protocol that allows you to reconnect for up to 30 seconds essentially. And then if it doesn't, it'll tell you you're unable to uh, disconnect. It'll throw an error. And if you have any questions on that, definitely visit our developer centers on the API reference. It's great information about um, displaying, you know, essentially knowing when people have lost connection or not. And then the next question, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lars. Yeah, the next question, and uh, uh, Parakseet here has already said that they're using configurable terms. So they're already right. experts in this. So uh, how can we get the uh, of, uh, IP address of the turn server um, and uh, you can comment, but I'm suggesting that we probably need to discuss this sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Right. So you can, uh, so perfect, I, I agree with that. We can discuss it one-on-one. -on -one. If Pratik, you can send me an email. My email is monic at talkbox.com, um, and we'll drop that in actually in the chat, so I'll do it right now, and we can get that information for you on how you can set that up. So there's my email, I just dropped it in. Um, and then the quality test. So we have two tests. We have the connectivity test and then the quality test. So you can both you can use these essentially with relayed or routed mode. So that's correct. And the information is available in the README of the chat. So you can use that there, Ian. I think you commented earlier, Manic, that what's happening is that the testing is using the events you're getting back from the streams and then right. interpreting them. And you're saying it doesn't matter what kind of session it is, you're still getting events back from the streams. 
saying whether they're happy or unhappy, and that's what's being interpreted. Right, and next comes back to Lawrence's point about signaling being on one end and then the media flowing through another end. So essentially, they're separate. So we definitely get we can get that information for you, even if you're going on a peer to peer mode. And oh, go ahead. Yep. And so we have customers who do not want the media streams to travel outside their corporate network. Um, I provided some initial answer about you could potentially use peer to peer. Um, however, then you're going to lose the uh, uh, all the routed mode capabilities. I didn't get around to typing in, Ian. Um, you know, we see this a lot, obviously, as a cloud platform. Our stuff is in the cloud. It's not inside the premise. Um, uh, encryption, uh, TLS, 256-bit AES, these are all things that in some circumstances have helped uh, customers say, okay, uh, stuff can leave the building. But I understand you may have very restrictive environments. Um, and, uh, and, and as you say, there's still a need to get to top box servers for call setup. And uh, yeah. we don't provide a way of avoiding that at this time. You want to comment on it? No, I think, Lawrence, I do, yeah. We don't, we don't have a way, uh, but we do have regional media zones, and they can help in that sense, but they, we can't guarantee that the, you know, the traffic won't be able to travel outside of the corporate network, just because you have to go through connecting to a peer that's outside of it. And if you have any questions on that, Ian, you can definitely follow up, reach out to support at talkbox.com, or email me directly at monic at talkbox.com, and we can get you the right answer on that one as well. Um, I think there's a couple of questions here on Unity, uh, yep. and 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 which may well be about how you surface some of these events into Unity, or go down and get get access to them directly. Right. So even the network drop in Unity Windows application is going to be the exactly the same because you're still using the same APIs to connect that user. So you can see if the session is becoming, if somebody is reconnecting. So as I mentioned earlier, events like session did reconnect or session did be begin reconnected or session did reconnect or fail, these are all going to be available in all those SDKs. So you can actually use these events to kind of create a flow for your customers or your endpoints to let them know that, hey, there's a network issue for you specifically, the publisher, and we're beginning to reconnect for you. And then either it's going to fail or not fail. So you will be able to handle that uh, really well with those events. Okay, and the next one is about, do you have a troubleshooting guide for users who fail the network test? Uh, Mic, webcam, speaker, bandwidth reasons. Um, I think this is extending beyond the, uh, the network test to testing for, do you have the right camera, do you have the right mic, uh, which are typically things that people build into applications. Uh, the application we're using here, uh, Crowdcast gives us a very nice dialog box for seeing what our setup is. So can you comment on that, Manik? I think that's great. I think exactly what you said. It's, it's actually the logic that we don't have any. So two-point answer, we don't have any best practices or a guide to say, OK, if this is happening, you should build with this. This is something that uh, you know I believe would be really great feedback from you. So I'm actually going to put this and channel this as our product team to get this guide out for us so we can get this available to your customers. And the second point is, even with that guide, you would have to implement this logic on your end based on you know the information that you get so you know if everything failed you'd have to display messages but yes it, the guide is not available but when it is you would still have to build on top of it uh, next question is about minimum bandwidth and i've provided the link to the article in the support area which was what i uh put on the slide that we were looking at so Perfect. um i i hope that's uh enough uh for that as we discussed in the network area, the SDKs will adjust, right? It's just that the video will get worse, right? So they will, they are automatically adjusting, uh, but the table at that link there shows you what will give you excellent performance and what will give you acceptable performance and what, what, what won't be good enough, uh, and you can take a look at that. Yes, that's perfect. Uh, from John here, what's the best mechanism to detect a problematic connection environment in real time as opposed to after the fact. Uh, yeah, like so, um, instructors when uh, particularly remote students here are uh, experiencing connection issues. Absolutely. So thanks for that, Lawrence and John. Uh, the, one of the things you can do is we have events that kind of tell you what the, uh, the, the, the packet loss you're seeing and things like that. So you can use these events in the SDK. Those are available to you to display messages or 
build on top of that to let the other people know that this specific student or the one that's speaking is having these issues. So there is API reference on our developer center, and I'm going to drop that link right now uh, so you can actually take a look and see you know information about it. This is specific to SDK, so the API might be a little different for SDK, but essentially the concepts are very the same. They're very much the same. So that means you have to really delve into the uh, event side of the uh, SDK. Yeah, the callbacks and events. Yep. And, and work out what you're, how to interpret those. And then here I have another question talking about crash when the publisher network drops or disconnects. Uh, so you should not have a crash when the publisher disconnects because you should be tearing down. So it's like essentially if you set the publisher and on the Windows app, if you're using the Windows SDK, you would have to set uh, the events to zero, nil, I mean, not have them exist and you would have to send the publisher also to null, so that's not there, but you should not be crashing the application, or the application should not be crashing if a publisher disconnects. Simply, you'll the application will be there, but the publishing would stop, and you should get the similar events that I mentioned about stream destroyed and connection destroyed. And if you do have any questions on those specifically, I recommend, and if you're seeing an issue that shouldn't be there, I recommend filing a direct issue on directly that repository. So I'm actually gonna drop a link uh, in the chat where you can, Answer that question. Sorry, ask that question. So I'm, I'm pulling up the link right here, and I'm dropping it in, and that's where you can ask Unity Windows questions if there are if that's happening to you with that sample application. A uh, question here about network test and PHP SDK uh, and Chrome extensions, and I think there's a a number of issues going on in here. One is to distinguish between server side APIs like uh, PHP and client-side APIs, which is where you've been doing the testing. Right. And then separate from that, there's this whole issue of screen share, uh, so let, which we'll get to. So let's answer the first question about yep. the PHP and JS and, and where so things you are cannot, going. So you cannot use the network test on the PHP SDK because there's two concepts. The PHP SDK lives on your app server, which is where you generate sessions, generate tokens, uh, where you start archiving, and then there's your client side, which actually connects, handles the streams, and that's where the network tests live. Um, you can't do it on the PHP SDK. You would actually technically have to have both to have a robust application. Um, and then the second part of your question on the inline plugin. So this is a great question. Uh, we just recently announced that, I mean, Chrome recently announced that they're deprecating inline installation for um, screen sharing. So what that really means, for sorry, extensions. So what that really means is if I press install in screen share, it's going to redirect me to the Chrome store and not have that experience available to me on my web page as it is right now. Uh, they mentioned some security issues for that. And to work on this, we actually, um, you know, we're following the issue very closely. We've been seeing that uh, there's been work done on the WebRTC area on this, and they're introducing new APIs where uh, essentially, if you're on a specific Chrome version and above, and then this new Get Display Media API, it'll be installed there. You won't actually need a screen share extension. But if you have users who are using the older versions of Chrome, they would still have to go and install the extension from the Chrome Web Store. So what you can do is you can display custom messages saying, hey, you know, you're going to be redirected to Chrome Store, so go ahead and install this specific application, uh, sorry, extension and then come back here and then you'll be able to start screen sharing. Um, and that'll be different for the different uh, uh, extensions. So if you're on a Chrome, uh, you know, a specific version and below, you have to go the extension way. But if you're on whenever this new feature gets implemented and you're on the latest Chrome, then you won't need this uh, extension at all. So I've put a link to the blog uh, in the uh, chat. And we will be shortly updating this blog with new information. And we will also provide updates when this uh, uh, Chrome thing is done. So just to replay it, because it is a little complicated, so I'm going to replay it for a second time. Um, essentially, you have one team within Chrome saying, we really can't allow these uh, instant extensions. They're a security issue. We must force people to go into the, uh, into the store to do, do the extensions properly. On the one hand, and on the other hand, you've got WebRTC that's been happily using these instant install extensions to make it easy to add screen sharing. And the WebRTC side has been behind because that's not how the spec says it should be done. The spec says it really should be done with these things already built in. So the WebRTC side in Chrome, in the Chrome team, is frantically trying to add that, uh, but they're not going to get there quite in time 
uh, to meet the deadline of the security team turning off the easier way to do it. They're still completely installable, they're just slightly nastier for people who are doing screen share, which obviously is typically people who are the teachers or the presenters, it's not necessarily the people who are seeing the screen share. You don't need any extension to see the screen share. You saw Manic screen share today, you didn't install any extension at all, but he has the extension installed. And once installed, it stays there, it's gonna be messier for a period to get it installed until the WebRTC team within Chrome catches up and makes it pleasant again. So just saying what Manic said again, just to make reinforce this, because it, it does seem uh, a little complicated. Please read the blog. Yep, thank you for that, Lawrence. And so I'm gonna jump on the next question. Is it possible to use OT screen share on high FPS? Yeah, you can actually set the frame rate to 30 frames per second when you create the publisher properties. So you can say video source to screen and then the publisher property for the frame rate to 30 frames per second. Um, that's available through the API, but obviously this is very dependent on your, uh, you know, your network condition. So if you have, if your quality is very poor and you try to do 30 frames per second, um, you might have a, you know, a delayed and it might not actually give you that quality because you, your bandwidth is not able to support that. But you can, let's say in an ideal world where our connection's amazing, uh, you can put 30 frames per second um, and be able to do screen share. So I didn't realize that, Manic. So I will correct my answer there and say that you can adjust the screen share FPS within the API. Yeah, but but not adjust. What you can only say it when you create it. So it's not being able to adjust as the video is progressing. That okay. kind of handles for you. And then the other mechanism we've used, where we've got a lot of video inputs, maybe even from cameras, is we make those be the USB camera input. So instead of using the camera on a laptop or a USB camera, you're actually feeding video uh, in, and there are ways to do that if you're trying for more of a sort of production feed environment versus playing YouTube video. Okay. Perfect. One more question. So it says, I know there's no way to change video setting on the uh, when it's progress, but it's possible to fix this on the feature. Um, so when you say uh, on the way, I mean, which video setting specifically? Yes, when you, you can turn off video on and off while it's in progress. So you can say publish video false and publish video true. So you can use that method to, you know, essentially turn off your video on and off. And uh, that allows you to do it in flight of the call. And uh, just for the sake of this, to show you that it works, I'm, I can, I'm not gonna press the button, but there is a toggle video button that you can do to turn it off and on, and it won't take too long to do that. Um, it's super easy to implement, but if you're talking about frame rates and things like resolutions, those are initially set when you create a publisher and not available after. Uh, but that's something that we can possibly, um, you know, if I ask for feature requests and see the right team and I can relay this feedback to our product team and also our engineering team to see if there is a possibility that we can expose this via a new API. And Thank as uh, uh, Sturgeon points out in the, in the chat, it's possible that the SDK will make alterations to what's actually being sent uh, based on the network performance. That's correct. So this is more like a recommended frame rate than actually like this is exactly what we're going to get. Um, and that's just there just to make sure that the SDK can make sure that you're actually connected in video, you're actually sending something and not trying to send 30 frames per second when it's not really possible. And today we have the last question on our users use tools like speed test to check their network and they go on to our app and see our network test and the values are different. Users that think this is a problem in our app, what do you suggest? So I, I think this is, this is a great question. It's something that uh, Lawrence Bird mentioned earlier, and it's that speed test is testing your whole upload and download, where this specifically, this test that we have is testing that exact connection that you have from that JavaScript, let's say, uh, browser to the media server. So that single peer connection is what we call it, is what it's testing. It's not testing everything. So that's the two different ways that you can explain to your customers saying, hey, that's to just make sure that's your complete internet, you know, and this one is just your connection to the video service. And I may be, that might be the simplest way to explain that. I think you have to make sure you use different words, right? You right. cannot use the word bandwidth because that will be interpreted as, well, I got bandwidth, yeah. right? So you want to call it, you know, application connectivity or, you know, video connectivity. You, you, you know, um, you have to name it and then say in some simple fashion, this is what it is and this is what you're getting for this application 
within your overall bandwidth umbrella. But I would absolutely avoid the word bandwidth as that will put people back into speed test thinking. Thank you. And I do see another question in the chat. It's not an official question, but I will say, okay, so you, it says, is it possible to set the video resolution in a Windows Unity application? Yes, it absolutely is. Just because the Windows Unity application is built on top of our Windows SDK, which has properties, which allows you to set the frame rate, which allows you to set the resolution. So that's all possible. Definitely check out our Windows API um, for that. So I'm actually going to go ahead and send a link to that in the chat right there. And that you should be able to see how you can instantiate a publisher with those specific properties that you're interested in. All right. I don't think we have any more questions for today, uh, but thank you everybody for coming on today and you know asking some really great questions. This was actually our longest webinar till date and the most questions that we have. Uh, so thank you so much. And a big shout out to Lawrence Bird on the other end for coming on and you know sharing his uh, expertise in the networking area and telling us how that can make a difference in a user's application. Thanks, Lawrence. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.